Hello, dear brothers and sisters. We are here today again. We're your guests, Michael and I, and we will talk about several aspects of the Gospels of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today, we will concentrate on evangelism, community, and the calling of Christ. So these are very important three aspects of the biblical accounts that have been practiced throughout the centuries to bring people to Christ. So uh, like I said, we will talk about evangelism, community, and we'll talk about how Jesus calls us to be part of his body. So first of all, let us talk about the evangelism. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus several times sends his disciples out to evangelize, to heal, to preach. At the end, he sends them out to baptize everyone in the world in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this is when it is clear that Jesus was presenting the Holy Trinity to the humanity at his birth and during his life. And therefore, he calls humanity back to the worship of the Holy Trinity, of one God in essence. So in this conversation with Michael, today we will talk about these aspects of the Bible. Jesus sends out his disciples. He wants them to go and convert and baptize, return humanity to himself, to the Holy Trinity to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. But how does he do that? Does he just randomly send his disciples? Does he give them any instruction? Does he tell them how this needs to be done? What to be careful from? What to be bold about when they are preaching and evangelizing the world? We can remember several instructions that Jesus gives to his disciples, one of which is that you go from one city to another, and if you are accepted in those cities, you preach. And then, if they accept your words, stay there and give them your blessing. If they don't, then shake your feet and go to the next. So Jesus teaches his disciples not to get stuck. He allows them to be free and to exercise their attachments to humans freely so that they do not depend or get stuck with one particular society or with one particular village or a household for that matter, but freely go from one to the other so that the word will be spread to all of humanity. And then there will be the next step. There will be the forming of communities. And the job of the disciples, of the apostles, will be handled by the communities. And that's what we will talk about next. But before we go to that, Jesus also warns his disciples. He says that you are going into the world like lambs. And be careful from ravenous wolves, the ones that will come in sheepskins. And they will disguise themselves and they will devour you. And we see from the history of Christianity that the early Christians were persecuted throughout many centuries. And even until today, Christianity is one of the persecuted religions, perhaps the main religion that is being persecuted in many cultures. What was the persecution? In the early first few centuries, Christianity was persecuted by pagans. And that was a severe persecution. Many Christians were huddled in places and burned alive or executed at the Colosseum, or beheaded or crucified throughout many cities of Asia Minor, of the Mediterranean area, where the cradle of Christianity was at that time. Then, as Christianity advanced, as heroism proved Christianity as a worthy religion, then many nations adopted Christianity to be part of their culture, part of their uh, national identity, and then Christianity advanced even further to the rest of the world. But everywhere it went, the first reaction was persecution. 
you can see in every nation when the first evangelists come, there is a persecution. So that was the other aspect that Jesus warned and told his disciples that this is going to be the case. And he said what they did to the teacher, they will do to the students. And if they treat it this way, the teacher, even worse, they will treat the students. So the disciples of Christ were the students. And they and their successors, who were the Christian community members, were treated the same exact way as Christ was treated, which means that he was crucified, he died, and he was risen. And so Christianity, at the first few centuries, was crucified many times as a common, as a group of Christians, and then it died, and then it was resurrected even strongly, even more powerfully, and it spread even further. Why has Christianity always been so persecuted? Like even here, where it's a country of supposedly free religion, you can't say Merry Christmas. It's, wh why That's has it always question. been so suppressed and persecuted? That's well, a very good question. Christianity is a religion of love and care and forgiveness. And that's not always clearly understood by the larger society. Christianity requires sacrificial love. And sometimes when people extend themselves to the society too far, that creates two things. That threatens the society, that you have to imitate these people now and you don't want to do that. And the other thing that happens is they, take, uh, are, uh, they get taken for granted. And so the persecution can be in multiple dimensions. One, in the first centuries of Christianity, it was a threat to many cultures. Because when Christians first started to show up in different countries, they were sh sharing and holding few common values. They claim that God is the only king that they recognized, that no language separated them, that no culture separated them, that the borders of countries did not separate them. So they were one community in the whole world. And the only thing they required from each other to just make the sign of the cross and recognize each other as they were the disciples of Christ, and that would unite them. And these things could be threatening for societies and from, for governments, because that creates a power that yeah. is beyond their scope, beyond... Or it creates a semi-empire almost. That like creates a different kind of kingdom. And that is very important aspect of Christianity, because when God revealed itself to Abraham and Isaac, and Moses, and Jacob, and all those hierarchs, throughout the centuries before Christianity, God had revealed himself as the only king, so that the Jews were recognized that there is only one king, and that king is God. But they wanted to imitate the nations that were surrounding them, which means that they wanted to have a king. And it is interesting that they go to the prophet, and the prophet gets kind of disturbed. And the prophet talks to God and says that the nation wants a king. And I know that there is no other king but you. And God comforts the prophet and says that they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. So don't worry, give them a king. And by giving them a king, kind of created this again, a second divide between God and humanity. They couldn't hold on to their value. While the Christians claim that reality back. There is no other king but God, they always claim. And it doesn't matter what country they lived in, they were all united at all times. We recently had a beautiful ecumenical service in Boston where all Christians came together. Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Coptic, Armenian, all Christians, their leaders, and members of their communities came into one beautiful big church, uh, the Church of the Name of Christ, and they prayed together. 
they had sermons and that showed that there is only one God and although there is division between Christians today there is misunderstanding among different parts of Christianity but they recognize each other as Christians some of them may be called heretic by someone some part of the church and some of them may not be understood correctly but yet they are called Christians as divided as Christianity is today every denomination of it is called Christian denomination so there is that central and uniting aspect of Christian and that is also other reason why Christians can be persecuted because they are divided if they were together one whole uh, body of Christ then it would be harder for people to consider to undermine this yeah. uh, wonderful community that exists so those are the things that will cause persecution but also persecution and suffering is an essential part of Christianity because when humanity is introduced with higher values there is also the factor of the evil the evil one has always found ways to pre create difficulty for, for God's immersion into the humanity as I, I brought the example of the people wanting king that was probably whispered by the evil one and there is always this struggle for humans to switch between God and the evil one so the history of humanity is formed in harmony or in relationship of these three realities God on one hand is always calling humanity to himself the evil one on the other hand is always tempting humanity to draw away from God and humanity in the center of it is always either uh, gravitating towards God or falling into temptation and gravitating towards the evil one so the persecution is put there by the evil one to stop the advancement of humanity towards God and so that is the ultimate reason why there is persecution because the evil one from the very beginning has decided and yearned to separate humanity from God which is the introduction of the first sin the Adam's sin to give them power to be gods by themselves without God and then as God has revealed himself to humanity as God has been incarnate and has drawn as the evangelist says plundered into the human race and claimed all the goods that belonged to him which means all the humans the evil one has found different ways of uh, creating barriers for humans to draw near to God at first physical persecutions and executions of Christians then heresies were introduced to Christianity to separate and split up and create uh, problems between Christians and then many many invaders throughout the Middle Ages came and wiped out all the Christian kingdoms and cultures and destroyed big cities that were created by the Christians and they were advancing in their <coughs> uh, closeness to God and in later years in the modern times there is the globalism and there is the ignorance the ignorant mind of some Christians and also the general population towards religions and therefore Christianity being one of those major religions that is present in all societies is facing that ignorant and careless attitude of the humanity but we can see that uh, when we, once we go to the community as I said that when disciples of Christ went out to preach first thing what they did was to establish many communities in this time we can see that St. Paul starts writing his letters and all his letters are written to different communities at first they were talking to individuals to persons or families and then as they advanced as they spread the news 
the good news of the gospel, then community is formed. And community is the main form of Christianity. There are no Christians individually. Yeah. Only Christians can be Christians when they are united in one community. And a community is what supports the Christian development and the growth. Then, very early in the end of the first or the beginning of the second centuries, we see the formation of the communities. When we see Jesus preaching in Israel, we see that big number of people always follow him as if this was some kind of community at the beginning, in the very beginning of Christianity that were with Christ at all times. But then within that community or within that group of people, we see diverse approach to Christ. St. John Chrysostom talks about this approach and says that there were many people who came to Jesus for different reasons. Some people came because they wanted physical healing, because they had maladies, illnesses, sicknesses, and they wanted and they had heard that Jesus can miraculously heal everyone who comes to him. So therefore, that was their only and main concern to see Jesus, to find that doctor who will heal them. There were other people who needed the physical cure, but also they cared about their spirituality. And a perfect example for this is when Jesus heals ten lepers. Nine lepers go away, they go to see, show themselves to the priest, and they don't come back, but one of them comes back. In the beginning, when they uh, arrive there, when Jesus heals them, they ask for cleanness. They ask for <laughs> leprosy to go away. And Jesus does that. And he sends them away to so show themselves to the priest. But when the last, last leper comes back, Jesus actually adds something. He says, your faith has made you well. Wellness does not apply only to the physical body. It also applies to our mental state, to our psychological uh, reality, to our spiritual consciousness. So Jesus makes him whole, makes him well, the entire person, soul and body and mind included. While in the first meeting when he had with the ten lepers, he only talked to them about their leprosy, about their malady that they had, the skin disease that they had, and he cured them from that. Now then also there are other kind of people who are following him for because he is the Messiah. And we, those are mainly his disciples, his 12 disciples. And then there is the larger group of disciples, the 70 disciples. And then there is a large group of women that are following him because they have found the Messiah. So there is that third group. There is the first for the physical cure, second physical and spiritual cure. And the third is that they are there because this is the Messiah. And then there is other groups. There are a group, there's a group that is there, a group of people who is present, just because they have heard about these miraculous works. And they are there to just find out how Jesus does this, to be witnesses of the miracle, of the amazing thing that happens. And then there are other people present at Jesus' site. They are there to see what can they catch him on. How can they accuse him in something to get rid of him because he is presenting a threat to the society or to the culture or to the religious mentality of that time? So there are also those who are there to test him. There are some people who are just present. So there is a group of different kinds of people that come to Jesus for different reasons. And there are people who are there for a wrong reason, very wrong reason. And we meet these people when someone draws near to Christ. We see this kind of people present when Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus because he find out about Jesus Christ and he sought to see him. But he was short and there was a group of people surrounding Jesus that was preventing 
Zacchaeus to see him. Zacchaeus was a clever man, and he finds a way of solving this problem. He climbs on a tree. He knows exactly how Jesus is going to travel. He goes on a tree that is right on that road, and he expects Jesus to come, and then Jesus notices him. So there is that kind of a group of people preventing others to draw near to Christ. They are still part of the same crowd. In another example, we see blind Bartimaeus, who is blind. He cannot see where Jesus is and how is he traveling. This is the opposite of Zacchaeus, who was a very clever and bright man, and he could see and he knew exactly what he was doing. In blind Bartimaeus' case, he doesn't know how to go about this. He knows, he has heard, that Jesus is performing miracles and that he also can give cure to him. And what's more desirable than eyesight? He has been blind entire his life and now he is hearing the news that there is th this one man who can give him his sight back and if nothing else, it will make his life so much better that he can actually walk and not stumble over things. But when Jesus draws near, some of this crowd, the people who prevented others to come near to Christ, they push him aside. They say, go away, don't bother him. And there is another group of people who actually says to him, oh, he is right near you. If you call him, he will hear you. So there is that contrast within the crowd that followed Jesus, the ones who were preventing others to get close and the others who were bringing people to Christ. Now we will, see, we will say, how can we differentiate those who call people to Christ and those who prevent people from getting close to Christ? We don't have to fixate on particular individuals or persons and try to identify and create a division among the, among the groups of people. But what we need to know for clear, for sure, is that this kind of behavior can be present in every person. At one time, you may be the person who brings others to Christ by your behavior and lifestyle. And in other times, you may draw people away from Christ or anybody, any one of us. So this behavior can be present in human beings depending on what they choose. So we said in the beginning that the history of humanity is shaped through the relationship between these three realities, God, the evil one, and humanity. So the evil one trying to attract people and God trying to attract humanity towards himself and humans choosing freely either go towards God or choose the evil. And that's when, when we choose to go towards God, we are part of that community that welcomes blind Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus and the little children who were kind of shoved away by his own disciples, by the disciples of Christ, in whom at that time there was kind of that protective mode that no this is our teacher we are protecting him and because we are running out of time i would like to touch upon the calling of god god in this triangular reality where go humans are in the center does not force humans to follow him does not trick humans to follow him but god draws humans with love and care and it is up to us humans to exercise our free will and go towards Christ, towards God. But the temptation sometimes can be really sneaky and really difficult to overcome. And we always fall and gravitate towards the evil. So calling of God requires vigilance. It requires to be calm and be consistent and persistent in our everyday life, step by step, one step at a time, draw near to God, get closer to Christ, 
through participation in the community that actually supports us to get closer to him. Imagine that we are those blind men, or in that case one blind man, who is always searching for God and he can hear that God is there. People are telling him that Christ, the Messiah, is around, but he cannot see him. And only by the support and the help of the community, he can actually draw near to Christ and say that I need your help. And in this case, the famous expression that the blind man cries and calls Christ near is Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And that is the key expression that we can daily, unceasingly use to draw near Christ and get close. Thank you and have a good day.